Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Natalie Gray. Welcome, Natalie. Hi, Rick. Hi, nice Anne. to be here. Yeah. Um, have you watched any of my shows before? I have, and uh, the longest one I watched is uh, the one you did with Martha Creek, because I knew Martha when I worked for BKI, so uh, it was like, Martha, oh, wow. So <laughs> Cool. So. Um, so I guess if you watch some of them, you sort of have a feeling for what makes me tick and, you know, some of the, the ways I approach this. Um, and at times, I may seem to be kind of a contrarian to um, the standard advice way of putting things. At, at, um, at least I have some doubts about the way uh, that is sometimes expressed. Um, and we can get into that during uh, the talk. Yeah. Um, so um, if you don't mind, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit, just so people have a sense of, you know, in a relative sense, who you are and, you know, your little bit of background, whatever you feel is, is pertinent. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. I, I, I feel the same way that you do in terms of the language. And uh, I use the non-dual language or the language of Vaita partly because it seems to make the most sense in terms of what I've been experiencing, but it still uh, is sometimes confusing as well. Um, so for me, um, let's see, I wouldn't say that I was looking for anything spiritual. I didn't even have any idea of anything beyond what I knew as a Catholic, being raised Catholic. Um, and... Um, and then somewhere around the age of seven, I asked a nun once if animals had souls, and she said no. And I was like, uh, well, no, okay, we're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We're done because I, I knew my cat had to have some kind of, you know, thing, and it didn't make sense to me. And then at 16, I decided to get confirmed anyway. I was still really stuck in belonging. I wanted to belong, so... It was too much of a step to break away, but soon after that, I stopped going completely, and then got into drugs, got into alcohol, and um, sometime around uh, graduate school, which would have been the 90s, I came across a, a article on uh, Suma Qinghai. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. I don't think many people have, and she's the teacher I first followed, and uh, she taught me about meditation, and then um, after her, I was with Yogananda, Parman Paramahansa Yogananda, SRF, for a long time, and uh, and then after that, uh, MSIA, Movement of Spiritual Inner Awareness. So then, you know, that's where it all started, and I was like, there's got to be more. There's got to be more than what's going on. I want to, I want to, what it was is I want to be enlightened. I want to be God. I mean, that's really what the the drive was manifesting as. And um, so I had all these ideas of what this waking up experience might look like and who I would be once that happened. And uh, eventually I was with Byron Katie and uh, I did the same thing to her that I did to everybody else, which was I turned her into a guru and she's got all my answers. But I'm still operating from the I really want to belong mentality. And, you know, my MO was I'd get on the outskirts of the group and then very quickly I'd get into the inner core. So I was working around or near the person that the group was founded on. And, um, and then I'd turn them into the savior or whatever. And eventually I realized I'd done that with Katie, so I stopped working for her. And that was the beginning of real finding for me. Um, I was like, I can't make anybody else my guru. It has to just come from in here. If it doesn't line up with me, it's not okay with me. And... Uh, I have to just go with what it feels like inside it, in terms of the certainty or the rightness of what I'm reading, what I'm finding, what I'm discovering. I uh, found a couple of books by Jed McKenna. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's from my town. Actually, uh, it, it, it's worth interjecting here that I think true gurus want people to realize what you realize there, you know, that it's not all about them or, or some kind of adulation or idol worship or anything else. It's more, it's more like, you know, realize within yourself, you know, what I have realized within myself. That's what I want for you, a girl, a, a true guru would say. And um, as far as Jed is concerned, uh, that's a pseudonym. Uh, I, I recently learned his real name, but I forget it. And I wouldn't say it anyway because he wants to remain anonymous. But yeah. uh, he has lived in, in my little town here. Um, and I, mean, I don't even know if he's still here or not. But <laughs> I've read a couple of his books anyway. 
Well, it's interesting that, you, that that's just hysterical because when I first read his book, I was like, oh, I want to find him. Yeah. And, you know, I knew then I did all the research and he's a, he everyone thinks he's mythical, that he doesn't exist. And I had a thought, well, somebody wrote the books and it doesn't matter. Somebody wrote the books and they were very important to me in terms of um, in terms of asking the question, first of all, if you're with a guru, how many enlightened people is that guru? Producing, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, what well, producing? Yes. Yeah. You know, and uh, not that gurus produce anything, but in terms of who's yeah, what, finding it. What, what are the fruits, you know? Yeah. yeah, what are the fruits, exactly. Right. Uh, and more importantly, just the idea that enlightenment isn't glamorous. It isn't um, pretty. Uh, it When it happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that your life is going to change or anything's going to get better. It could get worse. I mean, all that kind of got... I, I was able then to sort of let some of that go. And then I was in the Ojai library. That's where I live in Ojai. And uh, I was uh, browsing the shelves for a, a book. I was still reading because I still wanted to get outside input. And um, I came across the book Living on Duality by Robert Wolf, mm -hmm. and uh, found out that Robert lives here in Ojai and uh, decided that I would go see him and I didn't have any questions which is really interesting I didn't have any questions for him but I knew to go see him and uh went to see him and probably within the space of 15 minutes of us talking the shift happened I mean it was just really and it was really subtle like I went oh Oh, <laughs> that, was, that was the whole experience. And it yeah. was the whole, you know, and then it just was a cascading, oh, through the whole organism. Like, that's mm -hmm. what it's been ever since. It's just really subtle, like, oh, mm. oh. <laughs> so that's that's it. Cool. Well, I should add that, um, you know, we're doing this interview because you got a touch of me initially about interviewing Robert. And then you said, okay, well, me too. So I said, okay, I'll do both of you. So I'll be interviewing Robert in the next interview next week. Yep. And uh, I haven't gotten too far into this book, but I'm really enjoying it. It's it's extremely clearly written. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll maybe t we'll talk a bit more, more about that when I interview Robert. But um, I I feel like he um, kind of has a way of getting right down there and and putting you know abstract something very abstract and and, and difficult to put in words into words. Very yeah. Not, very nicely. So I can see why sitting with him for 15 minutes would pack a punch yeah well and you know you have to be i mean okay so there's no credit to me nothing that i didn't do anything you know mm -hmm. and whatever was available to ha to hear what he had to say was just ready to pop or whatever mm -hmm. you know yeah. uh you can ask well would it have happened if you hadn't gone to see him would it have just spontaneously occurred who knows it does i think it's yeah. irrelevant and you can also ask that who knows question with uh, all the other spiritual stuff you've been doing for years and years. I mean, there's a sort of whole cart and horse or chicken and egg uh, you know, conundrum that people are always bandying about. Um, you know, on the one hand, it might be argued that all of the seeking and practices and meditation and Byron Katie and everything else that you did uh, ripened you to the point where 15 minutes with Robert could do that. Um, and then on the other hand, it could be argued that, you know, awakening can't be there can be no causality with it you know it just is what it is and nothing can sort of make it happen and so on and, and there's some people who emphasize that perspective and, and dismiss the efficacy of techniques and teachers and everything else kind of wipe wipe them all away um what do you say to that uh, conundrum i think um it's an interesting way to pose the question for me what what is so i don't want to appear um argumentative but for me always how is the question asked is really important mm -hmm. and um so the way you just ask the question is uh, a setup i think because well i asked both sides of it you know i've said there's this way of looking at it and there's that way of looking at it right and i agree i think that's the way most people would look at it but those two choices uh kind of negate the whole a third choice maybe which is everything that happened could have or could not have been part of it in other words those spiritual experiences that I went through could not in my mind anymore. I can't separate that from eating eggs every morning or, mm -hmm. you know, could eating eggs every morning have been, <laughs> have been part of what got me ready for the awakening or could moving to a certain town or so all of life is 
conspiring or doing what it does and then waking up happens or it doesn't. And to be honest, I, I think we're all awake because we're all, okay, let me say this. So I can't see a difference anymore between awake and asleep. It's all just that mm -hmm. experiencing itself in the different many infinite states that it can. So without yeah. being too... No, I mean, Kat, my perspective these days is I can say yes to almost anything. And the next breath, I can say no to almost anything because th there's always some other perspective that perhaps should also be uh, given, <laughs> you know, credence. Um, and, and everything has its place and everything has its niche. And, um, you know, the fundamentalist so-and-so has his niche and, and uh, you know, the, the atheist has his and so on. So it's like... I don't tend to insist that things have to happen any particular way. Um, I mean, it, and feel free to interject at any point. I'm just kind of going deeper into this here, but it's sort of like one might argue that since you were sort of, uh, you know, it was your an awakening was going to come about for you. Uh, you went through the motions of this seeking and that practice and this teacher and so on. Uh, because you were kind of, you know, the kettle was getting ready to boil, and so that, that was a sort of bubbling that took place. One might also argue that, well, those things actually cultured your nervous system and cultured your intellect and sort of refined your, your mechanism of human experience to the point where you were, like this, this is Zen Roshi that said, you know, awakening may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. You know, so maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you were doing stuff that made you accident prone. Uh, and perhaps both, you know, even though those two perspectives seem to be um, contradictory, perhaps they're both right, each in their own way. Yeah, I, I had, I was, something that you said um, made me think of something. You know, here's one of the fun things about uh, whatever happened for me is I have no brain anymore. It's just really... <laughs> I can't hold a thought very long anymore. I mean, uh, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, to all that you said, yes, to all that you said. And even when I was with Yogananda, one of the, one of the practices of Kriya Yoga, because that's the kind of yoga that you learn in that organization, um, was the idea of preparing your body for the higher spiritual energies that enlightenment or awakening would bring you. Um, you know, I don't know. To me now, it's sort of like, it's sort of like uh, everything is possible. Why wouldn't it? I mean, why not everything? Why not, you know, you had a woman on the, a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about raising the vibration of the planet and that's her mm -hmm. job. Yeah. And, you know, at one point I would have been like, oh, that's just crazy. And, or at one point I would have been like, yes, you know, like, cause that's where I was at the time, you mm -hmm. know. And now I'm like, in this, uh, in this manifestation of life that seems to be part of what I experience every day, why not? Yeah. It's just a, it's just a label, you know. <laughs> it's just a label. I we, mean, we, we, yeah, we go, ahead. This, go ahead. Life would be so boring. I mean, we have to stay intrigued. We have to stay engaged with our life. Um, whether it's a life that looks painful and full of suffering and drama that way or whether it's, you know, I've got roses in my garden and I, and I have a lot of money and, you know, it, that, how exciting is that? You know, that story is, is so wonderfully fascinating. Yeah, I concur. And I mean, it's a vast and mysterious universe and, and it's easy to sort of fall into the attitude of, that we have it all figured out. But uh, I mean, you, you just look at it. Fun, I, I watched a video the other day of, about, it was an animation of the inner mechanisms of a cell, a single cell. Mm. And, and, and the, it was at one of those TED conferences, you know, and the guy was making the point that we perhaps understand maybe 1% of what's actually going on inside the cell. But on the basis of that 1%, I've made this animation. And it was just this incredible thing to watch with this uh, awesome, you know, creativity and intelligence and everything functioning as, as like in this kind, like an entire city in this little tiny microscopic thing. And when, you know, when you ponder that sort of thing for a moment, it leaves you in a state of 
it, it makes you humble, you know, and, and it leaves you in a state of um, appreciation of the vast mystery that we call life. And, and the way I, that's the way it strikes me. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, how amazing the idea that there could be aliens, you yeah. know, and, and now that to me is just like, and that's a form of the one, the, the is, the void, whatever people call that, you know, um, as much as you are, or I am, or this coffee cup, or, you know, mm -hmm. it, so what form will appear and why not UFOs and why not vibrational, you know, uh, uplift and why not meditation and why not all that stuff? Why not the spiritual marketplace and all yeah. of it? Which is not to say that people should become dilettantes and just kind of completely get lost dabbling in all that, that whole thing. Uh, but, you know, we each have our calling and, um, you know, people follow what they follow, <laughs> do what they do. And I, I do feel like there is something kind of ultimately, ultimate about non-duality. I mean, because it's like a tree, let's say, you know, the root of the tree is the sort of foundation of it. And then you go up and there's all this diversity, many different leaves and branches and so on. Um, and so, you know, there's that verse from the Gita many branched and endlessly diverse are the intellects of the irresolute, but the resolute intellect is one pointed. So, so there's no end to diversity and we can specialize in a particular field and study it for our entire lives. And we've still only got a tiny fraction of the totality of, of knowledge, which, you know, is still, is only a fraction of the totality of what probably really is. But non-duality is an attempt, I believe, to, kind of get everything to, to boil everything down to its common denominator, to its essence. It, I agree. And the experience of it is what you said it in the last line. It's like this one pointed, there's no, it's like having an anchor. Mm -hmm. There's no deviation from that place. It's an absolutely planted place. It, and yet it exists nowhere. I cannot tell you where that point is in, in my world or even in the world, and yet it's there and there's nothing that can move it. I mean, as I, and I'm open if that is, if that comes along and it's moved, it could, I'm, you know, so far that's not what I'm experiencing. You know, that's not what I'm experiencing. Well, would you say that the reason it can't be moved is that it's not a relative thing? I mean, relative things have their their sort of their place in space and time and their dimensions and so on and they can be moved from a to a to b even if it's an entire galaxy it moves but what you're alluding to is something which is beyond temporal spatial <laughs> you know realm and therefore it's it's um rock solid that's that's another verse from the gita there's this the the Pragya is anchored to kutasta. Pragya means intellect, and kutasta means the rock-like. And mm. so the saying implies that there's just this sort of rock-like solidity to that, and eventually one, the, the intellect gets anchored to that, and there's, just as you described, sort of an immovability. Yeah. I, I experienced that. Um, now, at looking back on the teachers that I've had that, that I made into gurus, and by the way, I made them into gurus. They, they did yeah. not make themselves into gurus. Uh, you know, I experienced that with Katie and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it, that rock solid and Robert, absolutely immovable in terms of that place mm -hmm. and where that is coming from. And it's like, and, and then to talk about it is very difficult because it isn't really something that exists. And, <laughs> and, and, and yet it seems like it is the author or the source of everything that exists. Mm -hmm. So very dichotomy, a very much a dichotomy, but it makes total sense from this point of view anyway. Yeah. There's this uh, little story from the Upanishads where this, the teacher asked the student to go and get a banyan seed and he brings in the banyan seed and he says, oh, okay, now crack it open. And he cracks it open and he said, what do you see? And I said, there's nothing in there. It's, nothing. Em it's, it's empty. And he said, that whole mighty banyan tree comes out of that emptiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's another thing that was really interesting to me, um, just from a, the curiosity, you know, it's been such a curiosity for me to experience it and how different it is from what I thought it would be. You know, so I thought when I uh, experienced awakening that it would be, and, and I want to be really clear, I, I didn't experience any awakening. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I, it seems like the disclaimer we have to say, but. <laughs> Limitations of the language. 
so um when when whatever happened the waking up happened um before i remember robert asking me very specifically are you ready to have it be something you're not are you ready f to lose everything something like that mm -hmm. and are you ready to lay down your preconceptions of what it might look like i was totally ready i said yes absolutely and uh so then he just asked me three very simple questions which caused a shift but um what it looked like afterward was so much like what it looked like beforehand that it was it, it was you know there was a part of it as there was a part of me that went like oh that's it <laughs> you know what i mean like it's so it's so friggin ordinary i mean yeah. it's just so ordinary and my life is not different i want my money back yeah well <laughs> totally hey i didn't sign up for this ride you know i'm not i'm not omniscient i can't see into the future i don't you know and i still have all this experience of natalie and natalie's life and all of natalie's emotions and you know and in in a lot of ways those are more intense because mm -hmm. there's not a filter anymore between the ex the direct experiencing and and uh and what's happening that's just what's happening and it's and it's okay so uh so everything changed and nothing changed. It's uh, and that was fascinating to me. It's kind of easy to explain the the nothing changed. You just sort of did it. I'm still Natalie and yada yada. But how, how take a crack at explaining the everything changed. Everything changed. Okay. So <laughs> what what is different is this this constant thrum or underlying hum or presence or whatever i don't know what you would call it of like whatever is happening is absolutely fine with me mm -hmm. Abs even if i'm in the middle of a, a, a holy terror you know rage or i'm in the middle of a, which doesn't happen too much anymore to be honest uh or i'm in the middle of a, a depression you know a, a hormonal shift caused by what's going on in the body or uh you know st stress in my family okay that's that's what's happening. This is all so very interesting, you know, and I can be absolutely in the middle of those emotions, mm -hmm. experiencing those emotions and underneath or included in or threaded throughout all of that is, wow, this is so fascinating. Wow. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Just wow. A kind of a wow, you know. So if a person's hearing you say that, they, they might say, well, how does it? I mean, you know, what are the mechanics of that? What is it about the structure of your experience that enables you to uh, be in relationship to your experiences in that way, whereas the average person uh, is bent out of shape by the same experiences? When the shift happened for me, what happened was the under was any belief that there was anything other wait any belief that there was anything happening other than that manifesting itself other than source manifesting itself other than god some people say god i love the word god to me that really works and mm -hmm. i don't mean it in the sense most people mean you know the void the absolute robert uses that word a lot mm -hmm. that is all it is and if that's all it is then what is to worry about what there is nothing to fear there's nothing to worry about it is it is and and here's the other thing there's no reason for it and there's no meaning to it it's just what's happening so i don't know if that explains your question it's the reason maybe why there's this fascination because there's no personal uh although it feels like there's an ego there really isn't one protecting itself i mean and that isn't to say that sometimes it doesn't, there is an experience of jealousy or whatever, um, but th that's what it is. It's just doing what it does. It's like I I'm experiencing myself through this one called Natalie as anger or as joy or happiness or laughter or worry or fear or whatever. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we can pursue it a little bit more, but that's definitely a, a part of it, I think. Um, and I'd like to pick up on the word belief because the, the word belief usually denotes or often denotes uh, some concept that one is clinging to without necessarily having an experiential foundation for it. 
I believe in angels, I believe in heaven, I believe in hell, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Allah, or whatever, and, but, you know, how do you, well, why do you believe in those things, one might, you know, how do you know for sure if there's angels or UFOs or anything else? Well, I just do, it makes sense, I believe in reincarnation, it kind of makes sense to me, but there's not really an experiment, experiential um, grounding for that, and I sense that when you use the word belief, uh, there's more to it than just, you know, a shift in opinion or attitude or some concept that you're clinging to. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because uh, there, you know, people talk like, like, I, like when they're saved or mm -hmm. when they have a conversion of any kind. Uh, what, how do I know that what I'm experiencing isn't... Uh, just what you said it isn't just like oh I, I i'm having the belief of it and that's why it's appearing this way i don't i absolutely don't know and it doesn't matter if if everything is the absolute experiencing itself or manifesting in all these different forms if there's nothing but the absolute and to my mind to my way of looking at it or to my experience what else would there be it's that that inside of that seed is nothingness yet mm -hmm. all comes from there if that's the truth, then um, then whether it's a concept in my head or not, it doesn't matter. It's still all that experiencing itself. It's mm -hmm. still the absolute experiencing itself. Whether it's non-enlightenment or enlightenment, that's just all the absolute. So, um, yes, for me, it's different than belief, and I'm open to it being something else. Yeah. Um, but I get the sense, I mean, it's an interesting thing, the idea of knowledge or, you know, sitting with Robert, let's say, being able to evoke uh, a, a profound shift and have it be, you know, sustained. Um, because I think it's different for different people in the sense that, um, some, some people hear words and they either don't understand them or they just believe them, but there's this sort of like, you know, kind of a, it's without foundation, it's without a connection to, to experience. And other people may, might hear the same words, and those words can actually um, be a catalyst for a, a reorientation of experience in which the experience then comes to substantiate the words. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and there are a lot of people running around these days who are just parroting the words uh, and mistaking the, uh, a facility with those words for the actual experience to which the words are supposed to point. And, but they think that's it. In fact, there's a Tibetan proverb that I've said ad nauseum on this show, and that is that uh, don't mistake understanding for realization. Don't mistake realization for liberation. And mm. I think there's a lot of people in sort of spiritual circles these days doing the first thing, mistaking an understanding and saying, that's it, I'm done, you know? Whereas they might be in for some pleasant surprises somewhere down the road. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I had that thought for myself as well. Like, how do I know mm -hmm. what I'm, what I've experienced is not just that, what you talked about that first part where I just, I can speak the language. I actually can't speak the language very well, but, um, you know, that I could, I could probably pass, you know, um, is there some kind of behavioral test that I, you know, that I, <laughs> that I should be passing, you know, and this is a trap, I think, that people fall into, like, that could obscure awakening, is like, awakened people are always kind, loving, uh, they never lose their temper, you know, they, um, life becomes very easy, problems drop away, boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The meaning in that, in that, I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't know the exact quote, but the meaning in that quote, you know, before enlightenment, carry water, chop wood, after enlightenment, carry water, chop wood, is, it's very literal. Nothing changes. Enlightenment doesn't fix your life. You know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make anything easier. It doesn't take away, it doesn't take away human experience. Right. It, you know, in my, that's what I'm experiencing. So, mm -hmm. am, you know, I think that is for me how I can say this is the real deal and 
I'm still, it's still a, a process. Even mm -hmm. if it's the real deal, it's still a process. Yeah. There's still, every day is an pro amazing process, you know, of, of something else falls in or something else is released or I don't know how to describe that. No, you're doing good. Um, in fact, I'm reminded of the Gita again where Arjuna asked Krishna, well, how does an enlightened man walk? How does he talk? How does he sit? How does he act? And, you know, and Krishna didn't give an answer to those questions. He gave more of a, a description of the inner condition. And then, you know, once Arjuna's enlightenment was achieved, he said, oh, by the way, go out and kill all these people. You know, <laughs> do this very intense human thing. I still want you to do it, you know, in your new state of equanimity. <laughs> And, and that's it. I mean, that is it. I am still, you know, I am still eating meat. I am still, uh, you know, uh, losing my temper here and there. I'm still terror. I'm a very impatient driver in traffic. You know, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, like I said, the, the, the experience, the life isn't different. The outer isn't different. What's different is that place inside that I spoke about where, underneath or in threaded within everything is this this fascination this like this objectivity almost yeah you know maybe that's a schizophrenia i don't know <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> no. but i think it can for some people when that experience is happening i think it can it can feel like that for some people because the mind just goes what the heck is happening yeah. you know yeah and it really is the death of the self mm -hmm. and after I went through my uh, shift with there in Robert's house, I I uh, I came home and I think for about four weeks I sat on my on my lazy boy in my living room and I I was pretty immobile. I mean, I had no desire to do anything and I would say depressed would be a, an adjective. It was stunning, like literally. You know, stunning means to stop something, yeah. like to stun. There was an actual stunning response, you know, because if you understand that you're not the author, you have no free will, you have no choice, this is what's happening, and you're, you're in for the ride, and there's, you know, fasten your seatbelt and <laughs> put your arms in the air, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a bit, um, it's pretty deflating for a while. Yeah. It kind of sounds like what happened to Eckhart Tolle, you know, where he had his awakening and just ended up sitting on a park bench for a couple of years, just, uh, you know, until he kind of reor got reoriented enough to pick up a new momentum. Um, and that, that brings up a whole other interesting thing, which is, you know, the authorship of action. Um, you know, when one is accustomed to feeling like I am doing this and then a shift happens, especially if it's an abrupt shift, which is, it can be. I mean, it can, it can be so gradual that one integrates it every step of the way, but it can be abrupt. And then it's like one can lose that sort of motivation you know? and yeah. until something kind of adjusts or, or you know. Yeah, and that sounds like what happened to you. Yeah, and, you know, and then, you know, here's what's so fascinating to me. Like, I was an actor for a long, long time, and uh, and then I wasn't. And then uh, recently, I started doing voiceover acting again, and it's like, wow, look at this. I mean, it's just a normal life, mm -hmm. you know. It's just a normal life, and I don't get omniscience, and I don't get, you know, the ability to walk through walls, and I don't get, you know what I mean. I don't get any of the stuff that the, was in the brochure, you know what I mean? You could get some much bigger roles in Hollywood if you could do those things. Yeah, if I could do those things, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's fascinating to me to watch it unfold, you know, like, uh -huh. wow, here's the interest. It's so, and you know, it's so, it's so ordinary and non, it's essential and non-essential. Mm -hmm. So all those things, you know, we're all here because we need to be. And when we're not needed, we're gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if something happens for us, that's what it was supposed to be. And so there's there's no doubt anymore. Like, is this right? Is this true? Is this good? It's absolutely good if it's happening. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, that's very Byron Katie-ish also. It totally know? is. <laughs> <laughs> it totally is. <laughs> yeah. Loving, loving what is. Loving, well, I don't always love it. And uh, that's just what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's a... Uh, it, it, um, Robert is very interested in quantum mechanics and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He's going to be releasing a book soon on that. But um, 
I also am. And so sometimes, he, you know, he'll explain things that way. And one of the things he talked about, uh, it's something called wave function collapse, mm -hmm. which is that, you know, the, all possibilities exist until the observer is looking or, you know, until it actually collapses into being what it's going to be. And that for me is how I'm experiencing stuff these days. You just never know. I mean, I had thoughts this morning about what will I be like in the interview? Mm -hmm. What am I like? You know, <laughs> isn't it interesting to see? And, it, and it's, it's a little frightening because I think one of the things we want to do as human beings is control. Mm -hmm. And not only other people, but ourselves, especially. What will come out of my mouth? What will, you know, I can't, I can't scratch my nose or, you know, fart or, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh my God, I might say something I shouldn't. Uh, I need to get everybody's approval. I need to get everybody's love. And that's very, this is all pretty, a lot of Katie stuff, but on this side of, of, of waking up, it's like, that's gone. You know, it's like, and if that's there, it's fine. And, right. you know, um, it's just fascinating now to watch that I don't really care what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I don't care what I'm going to show up like. I, I still have the question. You know, I still go, oh, I wonder. Oh, I have to remember not to talk too fast. You know, I, I talk really fast. Um, don't ramble, you know, and yet this, this, it will show up as it does. Mm -hmm. So that's. Yeah. I mean, it's that way for me too, from this side. I, uh, Interviews go best if I just settle in and speak whatever comes to mind in the process of doing it, as opposed to trying to adhere to a structure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You never know what might show up. <laughs> yeah. um, I, for, this seems to be Gita Day for some reason, but I'm reminded of another verse. You have control over actions alone, never over their fruits. Uh, live not for the fruits of action, nor attach yourself to inaction. So. Um, you know, we have, and even the word control might be a little bit um, inappropriate, you know, it's like, but at least in this very moment, there's um, a, a sense of, you know, willfully speaking these words to you, that they, they, they are what happens to be coming to mind, um, how, what you're going to say, what the fruits are going to be, what, how someone's going to send me a nasty, nasty email for saying this or that, or whatever. <laughs> I have no control over. <laughs> you don't. And from where I'm sitting, I don't even have control over what's coming out of my mouth and what or how I will act. It just happens and, spontaneously. Well, I mean, I don't have control in the sense that there's no I mechanism mm -hmm. that's doing it. In other words, you've talked before about who is it, what is it, who is the author of action? Mm -hmm. The author of action from where I can, from what I experience is, looks like me. And when I try to find that me, it absolutely is the space inside the seed. And if that's the case, then that, it, then it goes back to the original author, the, yeah. the, the source, you know? So I say, I am the one doing it, but where is that I? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what is that? Yeah, good point. Um, it's said sometimes that it's it's just the tendencies of nature doing it. It's that, that which is governing the whole universe is governing, the, you know, the, the form of Natalie. And you could say that. I mean, why wouldn't you say that? You know, why, 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 if you look in a scientific point of view, you know, especially with quantum mechanics and stuff, what is that, what is that we are all made of? That, that, um, that stuff underneath the the cell and the atom and the mo you know molecule and the atom and the quark and the mm -hmm. w they can't find it they don't even know what it is right. you know what I mean? so and yet if that's what we're all based upon then that is what is even from that point of view that's what is the author of all of it yeah yeah it's it's interesting um, now that you're talking about physics I I've been thinking about this theme that you just said. And um, taking as an example a cup, you see, um, you know, on, on this level, it's obviously a cup. We call it a cup. We use it as a cup and so on. It has a practical significance. Uh, on it. But if you, if you go down a little bit to, say, the molecular level, what you're just dealing with maybe some carbon and some silicon and some this and that, which on that level would not be recognizable as a cup. You know, yeah. maybe it's a rock or it's, a, it's an ashtray or something else. Uh, and, but if you go deeper to the, the atomic level, um, you're... It, you could be in a liver or in 
in an air molecule or something, you know, because there it's just uh, so fundamental that there's no identification of any qualities that would any longer be seen as a cup. And go deeper than that, and you know, it becomes truly universal. Um, not even necessary. It's not even necessarily matter at all anymore. So, but human awareness is comprehensive. You know, it's like we can we can take we you know we can have cup appreciation at the same time appreciation of that which is uh, you know beyond all forms uh, and you don't have to kind of lock into any one level it's it's sort of it's the nature of our our structure that we're capable of encompassing the whole thing from absolute to relative and everything in between yeah because if we couldn't then it wouldn't exist I mean if we didn't have the ability to be discreet about that if we didn't have the 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 cones and rods and our eyes and all the physiological structure that goes with it and the mind that separates mm -hmm. um you know we wouldn't have the cup right. the liver the body we would be like what would we be you know what is that you know what do you when you are at one when you are literally at one you know like not consciously separated mm -hmm. where are you you don't you know you don't exist so yeah that that discrete awareness has to be there for existence to even happen right. so-called existence you know i remember K katie does a great exercise uh, in one of her workshops but uh i don't want to give that away but uh i remember um i remember this was a few months before i went to see robert i was sitting on a friend's porch and i was thinking when is the first time that i thought i and I remember distinctly being about three years old and I was tying my, trying to tie my shoes, learn to tie my shoes. And I, I have a vague th thought of my dad being there and me focusing on the shoelaces. And what I realized in that moment is that is when I was born. Because before that, before that first moment of I, and when that first thought of I happened, then the whole world existed. And it, it didn't exist for very long because I don't have another, you know, following memory, but for, for quite a few years. But in that moment, I existed and mm. I was born then. Mm. Everything else is a story like you were born and then you had parents and you were in the, you know, I don't know. I wasn't there. So yeah. I cannot tell you if that's true or not, you know. And so without that conscious I, there's no I, you know, I mean, there's no, there, the whole world vanishes without I, literally. Yeah. I think developmental psychologists talk about that kind of stuff, about how we develop an I sense, you know, at a certain age and so on. We we change our identification with mommy and, you know, I don't know, I, I'm not a developmental psychologist, but there is definitely a, an accretion or, a, 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 you know, a consolidation of an I sense at a certain age, um, which has its utility. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it does. And I mean, we wouldn't have a life without it. I yeah. mean, I think to me, what, I've, what I'm thinking of lately is, you know, the, they, they say the Big Bang happened, you know, from nothing, as far mm -hmm. as I can tell. And, and, then, and then in like the blink of an eye, boom, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole universe. Uh, and it happened everywhere all at once is what the, the theory is. Mm -hmm. And that is how I experience the birth of I. It's like a big bang. It's like I boom the whole world. Mm -hmm. As soon as I boom the whole world, then separation and computers and you know I might not have the names for everything, but that's when everything starts like that fast. So if that happened when you were three, uh, then you know when you were two, if you fell down and skinned your knee, it would just be pain without my pain. Is that what you're saying? Would it even be pain? I don't know. What I'm saying is I don't know that the world even existed before I. I I'm literally saying I don't know. So does it have any relevance? Does it even matter? The, the whole world begins and ends in I. Well, your parents probably took pictures of you when you were a little baby. And so here's, here's a picture. It's proof that, you know, Natalie was this little tyke. Um, but, you know, from your perspective, the world didn't exist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, obviously, I mean, this is a point we can make, play with a bit, maybe, that, you know, the world, the existence of the world, I would argue, is not dependent upon our 
recognition of it. Um, I was kind of getting into this with Rupert Spira a couple of weeks ago, and I'm not sure if we really got to the bottom of it. Um, but, you know, you, you, there's a room, let's say, with, the, with 500 people in it, and there's, a, there's a natural variations in people's perception of that room. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a certain structure that's more objective than anybody's individual evaluation. You know, there's a stage and a microphone and a pot of flowers or whatever. And if somebody who's never been in that room comes in there, and they see it too. So there's, I mean, sometimes reality, you know, people kind of talk in such a way that uh, everything is completely dependent upon uh, an individual's, um, you know, apprehension of it for its existence. And it seems to me that that is kind of uh, putting too much emphasis on subjectivity. <clears throat> that there's a larger objective reality that, that we as a human mechanism have a peephole to, uh, you know, to, through which to appreciate. Well, let's see. In a sense, I think I agree with you, but, but from the point of view of, uh, for me, it always comes back to who is the author. Mm -hmm. So if the author is source or God or the nothingness, the void, you know, uh, then whether I, whether there is a discreet I, Natalie, having that experience or not, yes, those manifestations are happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then... I could also say, and that's subjective because what does it matter if I don't experience it? Mm -hmm. So both are possible in that relative world, but from the point of view of it's all just the one doing what it does, mm -hmm. then, then yes, why not? And what does it matter? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't want to be flip, but in a, I'm in a real sense, what does it matter? Because it is all just the one. So, yeah. you know, is there a, is, if the earth is spinning on its axis and we're on a ball of, you know, water and we're going around and it is as we perceive it to be, um, and it's there whether we perceive it or not, it's still just the one yeah. as a form, you know, so that's where all the, that's where all of it comes from now inside of me. It's like, and it's still just the one. And then you can play with it, you know, like mm -hmm. you said, D yeah. did we, re did we resolve it? I don't know if we ever can, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I don't know. It's just it might just be a sort of one of those you know, if a tree falls in the forest kind of arguments, uh, it which doesn't mean... which are just sort of entertaining, but <laughs> not, not essentially critical. <clears throat> well, I think it. I think it is. I think it's interesting from the point of view of <clears throat> we get caught up in that. You know, like if there is a world that exists independently of our perception of it, mm -hmm. um, then we have things like we need to make sure the world is okay when we're here, when we're not here, what will we leave to our children, blah, blah, blah. And I think in that sense, when we perceive the world in that way, like there is an objective reality that exists outside of us um, or outside of our perception, that's when we can start to get into things like, oh, the planet is in trouble. Oh, we're not doing well. Oh, you know, um, you know, uh, pollution is causing the, you know, the destruction of us or, you know, so not to say that that isn't all true. And that is where I think the, those things like fear and panic and, and, um, we need to do something and bandwagons and causes get born mm -hmm. because we forget that even if that's the case, it's still, the, we're not the ones doing it. It's still source doing what it does. Yeah, but I'd say it's a both-and situation where we do need to do something. The planet is in trouble. There do need to be people who try to take measures to change things. Um, and it's that source doing that through them. Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. it's not like we all just sort of sit down and become blobs and let anything happen that happens. You know, the, uh, it's possible, I think, to be dynamically committed to a particular cause and at the same time have that perspective that you've been articulating of... Um, you know, everything is perfect. So everything's perfect and everything needs fixing, both <laughs> at the same yeah, time. Yeah, well, if you have that perspective, then obviously that's how source is manifesting itself as someone who needs to fix things. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then, of course, you need something to fix if you're that kind of a person. You know what I mean? If, 
then you need something to fix because otherwise you're purposeless and you know so it, i think it all works so well the way it the way it the way it goes out you know sure well if you're walking down the street and you see a little kid about to ride a tricycle in the traffic uh, chances are you know uh, no matter how um established in equanimity and dispassion and so on you are you're going to rush out and try to grab the kid and get him out of traffic there's something in the situation that needs attending to and you know the, and the entire experience of doing that might be completely one that oh it's just you know i'm detached from this activity source is doing this and so on but still there's a there's a specific action that one is motivated to take for a specific purpose is there not well i don't know um <laughs> Purpose is something I'm not all that worried about anymore. Uh, why things are happening, you know, th there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of there's a lot out there these days of find your purpose, find your calling, find your passion, and um, I'm not against that. And I spent a lot of time and energy and unhappiness trying to pinpoint what that was when there wasn't really one in there. If there's a purpose. Because what, I think what happens is when, when we focus on, I have a purpose, we, we lose our life. We're, we're, we're losing the experience of our everyday life. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so I'm going to get a little bit soapboxy. But, sure. <laughs> but okay, so like one of the things that's so amazing about this perspective now is, is intimacy has taken on a whole new uh, awareness. And what I mean by that is, I cannot, it cannot get any more intimate than itself in this form, experiencing itself in that form, that form, talking to itself, mm -hmm. exchanging its disparate ideas, experiencing itself as a mug being drunk out of, experiencing the coffee that it is being drunk experiencing itself experiencing the coffee i mean it doesn't get any more intimate than that this is it, this is the one experience mm -hmm. i am nothing but this and this and that and the keyboard and and like if if i sit that and and experience that it's like there is no need for any other because i am all others mm -hmm. And there's no need for a purpose other than what is happening here. And so what I experienced myself doing when I was trying to find my purpose in life, Natalie's purpose, was missing the everyday purpose that was already manifesting every moment. Yeah. It, it is given to us in every moment. There's a quote. You know, it's all here in every moment. The whole thing is given to us. Mm -hmm. And... And if we miss it, that's great because that's what was meant to be. And oh my God, when it's not being missed, it's amazing. Okay, so. <laughs> well, that didn't sound very soapboxy. Okay, good. <laughs> that, that's fine. I, I, I get more soapboxy than that sometimes. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, it, I guess maybe here, you know, the, the word purpose can have different connotations. I mean, if it's sort of like, if we mean purpose like if I don't fulfill this my life is going to be a failure and I've got to find what's <clears throat> going to make me great and yada yada then um, you know I get what you're saying but it doesn't mean that um, that there's no meaning or significance to things uh, one can there is a purpose to saving the child from getting hit by a car it's to you know save the child from getting hit by a car it's uh, or even larger goals of, let's say, I, you know, let's say a person who is spiritually awake, talking the way you talk about things, who's a young student, decides to become a doctor and, you know, save people's lives on that level. There's a motivation. There's a drive. I don't think that that kind of thing is um, in incompatible. I don't think that the two sort of perspectives are mutually exclusive. They, they can all fit as part of a larger whole. So that, I, I just don't think purpose necessarily it has to be a dirty word. You know what I mean? No, I, I, and I don't want to make it a dirty word. What I want to, what I want to be aware of or point out is that, um, is that I think we are so quick to assign reasons for things. Mm 
If I save a child or I don't save a child, why do I have to find a reason for it? Why does there have to be a purpose attached to it? It is simply what, what if it, it is simply what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, um, if I if I become a voiceover actor, then you know I I personally don't think anymore there is a meaning to anything. Mm -hmm. I think it is. Uh, it's just what is, it's just the play, the Leela. It's just what's manifesting. And, uh, and then, of course, if purpose shows up or a meaning shows up, that is, you know, again, I'm going to be like a broken record. It's just the one. The one is in everything. You know, it is everything. So I don't know. I see what you're saying. I mean, if I'm a young student and I decide to go to medical school and go to graduate school and become a, a find a cure for cancer or something, it's just the one doing those things, and per, and it can be perceived as having great significance and purpose, and on some level it does, but still, it's all just the, the one, you know, acting out that particular role in the grand scheme of things. It it, it feels that it appears that way to me. That's my experience these days. Yeah. Um, and what is sweet about that? is that is there's this humility that comes with that mm -hmm. so that um you know one of the things i so much wanted if i were going to be enlightened you know i want enlightenment because i'll be amazing you know what i mean yeah, it yeah. means something about me right right this is the most ordinary thing i've ever gone through mm -hmm. you know like it's just so ordinary it has no there's no specialness about it and it was on, on that egoic level that was so disappointing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like what you mean? And actually it's, it's the sweetest part. Like everything is just so ordinary. You know, mm -hmm. I'm the president of the United States is an ordinary. It's just ordinary. Yeah. I am ordinary, you know, and I say I'm saved from having to um, be more, do more, uh, live up to some idea. And, and then, and and then because everything is ordinary, in a sense, it becomes quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. I mean, the subtitle of this show is Conversations with Ordinary Spiritually Awakened People. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I haven't uh, talked to anyone yet that's, I would say, extraordinary. I mean, they might be a little bit out of the, out of the norm um, of, of our society, but when you get right down to it, um, they all you know, perform the same bodily functions. <laughs> and, well, in, you know, and even those that are, you know, that you've had some people on here that are quite well known, Gangaji mm -hmm. and Jeff Foster, and I think you even did Adi Ashanti. And, you know, those are people who are all uh, quite well known, even outside of non-dual circles, I think. And, yeah. and yet my, my experience of watching them or hearing them uh, is, is how ordinary they are, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I brought Adyashanti to my town here to do a couple of sat songs. I got to go out to lunch with him, and mostly we talked about, like, how he likes to get big Christmas trees and cover them with ornaments and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> and bicycle racing and, you know, what movies, we, TV shows we like and, you know, things like that. <laughs> well, yeah, because that's it. The human experience is still happening through the one called Adyashanti, through the one who mm -hmm. says, I'm Adyashanti, you know, and that that that's just what's so amazing is I don't have to have your experience because you're having it. Source is having it through the one called you, you know, through mm -hmm. the one called Rick. And I don't need to worry about that. It's being taken care of, you know, Yeah. you, you get yeah. it. And yeah, go fact, ahead. some of the, uh, you know, the, the ones that, from history that we have great respect for because of the legacy they left, like Kabir, uh, I believe he was a weaver or something or a potter or some such thing, but left this beautiful poetry. I think, you know, Rumi lived a fairly ordinary life and, you know, there's just sort of, I, I suppose the point we're making, and it's good to bring it out, is just for people, because you yourself, you know, said that you went through a phase of adulating people, and so did I, um, putting people on a pedestal, and, and it's good, and it's not that, you know, these people aren't worthy of respect and appreciation, but um, it's just that, you know, the, that one, one can show up, the oneness can show up in so many forms, and you know, the janitor sweeping a floor at the local high school might have a clearer realization of that than somebody who's up on a podium, for all we know. Yeah, and that's what's interesting about it to me. It's like you, it, even the idea that someone could be, you know, 
no one's, you know, I can't say I'm enlightened and then everybody's going to have their experience of that mm -hmm. with me. Like, say like with me, like, okay, is she or isn't she? Ah, you know, I don't think so. Whatever. Yay. You know, that's great. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Here's what the, here's one of the most devastating things for me was being awakened means nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really means mm -hmm. nothing. It's like, okay, great. I have this awareness I didn't have before, or there's an awareness here that I didn't have before. The eye is pretty dead. Um, okay, what's for breakfast? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. really? Because <laughs> now there's still the rest of life happening, and I didn't disappear. I mean, the body didn't disappear just because the awakening happened. So there's still a husband and cats and, you know, all of that happening. And the same with all of those people that we just talked about. And so what is, what else would you talk about with Thadi Ashanti besides Christmas trees and movies? And because that's life, you know, yeah, yeah. and people want it to be something other than that. And, and that, I think that that expectation that it could, it was really important that Robert asked me, are you ready for it to look like, mm -hmm. It's totally different than you imagine it to be. And I thought he meant like, awesome. I'd be, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought awesome. And then when he asked me the question, I was like, oh, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to disappear in one moment. Right. You know what I mean? And it's like, oh, I'm still here. You know what I mean? Well, when you say that it was devastating, that things were still so ordinary, there must have been some remnants of Natalie that would find it devastating because well, yeah. you, you probably got over that. Well, and you know, I did because it, it's like, and, and there's, you know, this, it's like, um, it's like, I think in this book, in this first book, Jed McKenna talks about like, you know, there was an ego and then I took it off and I was, there was enlightenment and then I, I didn't have anything better to do. So there was still that Jed ego lying around. So I just kind of put it on and walked mm -hmm. around with it. It's kind of like that, like, uh, <laughs> and like that implies he had a choice and there isn't any choice in that. It's just, you know, it's just what it, what it is, you yeah. know? Well, like we were saying, there has to be this structure and personality and so on in order to function in the world as you know otherwise we'd just be lying on a bed not... <laughs> and some and some of us are i think there are probably some of us that are so <laughs> yeah yeah well there's stories of you know saints in india who pretty much had to be fed and you know prevented from wandering off into the forest because there's just very little semblance of any sort of personality left that's right <laughs> that's right <laughs> um i'm sorry go ahead no, I was just gonna say it could be like that. I can see that it could be like that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> sort of also depends upon your social circumstances and what impacts you. You know what your what the flow of your life has been already and the the structure to which you uh, you know have been conditioned and accustomed. It kind of you know bills come in the mail and telephone rings and daughter wants this and husband wants that and so you know you just respond to the circumstances of your particular dharma. Yeah, and I you know I think. I, I had the thought, you know, I don't, I'm just going to leave. I don't care. And I'm going to go, uh, I guess I like having a bed and three hot meals a day too much. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still here. You know what I mean? Uh, and yet at the same time, and, and that's, and that's going back to like, and did I, is, I'm still here implies I chose it. It's absolutely not. I'm absolutely not choosing anything. There's no choice, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? How do I know this interview should have happened? It's happening, you know. Uh, that's very Katie again, but you know. Well, you know the old chop wood, carry water thing. I mean, for a for a monk who might have written that, it was chopping wood and carrying water. For for a mother, it might be uh, changing diapers and cooking meals. Uh, right. You know, same activities as before. Yeah. Just... I mean, you know, in her. Katie talks about that, like, you know, I'm, I, I, I do the dishes. I hated doing the dishes before. Now I, I actually like doing the dishes as well. And, you know, that's that. It's do the, it's whatever the, because everything is so ordinary, in a sense, things lose their color. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, things become more precious. Yeah, yeah. And um, it sort of doesn't make sense, but it's like doing the dishes is just as amazing as, you know, 
maybe taking a, a be having a massage or you know i'm trying to think of the things that people would think of or you know maybe having a thousand dollars and watching watching a gorgeous sunset on the, yeah exactly malibu or someplace exactly. <laughs> you know ch changing your baby's poopy diaper i mean uh -huh. isn't that amazing it's baby's yeah. poop you know what i mean <laughs> look at what happens you know it's it's uh so things kind of lose their their icky factor, their gross factor, their, I mean, that's, you still can have that reaction like, Ugh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I have a, here's a, an example. Um, every once in a while, my gallbladder will act up and uh, pain is fascinating from this side. And I, I want it to go away as fast as I ever did before. And it's really interesting to be with it and go, wow, this is what's happening. This is what's happening, you know, some intense pain is really happening where it's the aspirin or where's the relief and it's okay that it's happening, you know, mm -hmm. so for whatever yeah. that's. Sure. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we sort of respond normally to normal situations regardless of our um, you know, awareness or state of consciousness or whatever. The body is a body. If you put your hand on the hot stove, it's going to, you know, pull away. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's, you know, there's, in the literature, um, people talk about how, you know, with realization should come these mystical powers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's related. You know, I don't think that the proof that you can do this, that, or the other thing is any proof that you have a real awareness of, what is what awakening is or what that sense of oneness um my understanding more... of that stuff is that it can be developed um uh, without a sense of oneness and it can also come after the sense of oneness is established as a sort of an icing on the cake kind of thing that develops over time uh but it's no absolute criterion of anything one way or the other no i'm not sure how you would decide what an absolute criteria for that is because i, I don't know how i could look at someone and say they are they are not realized i have no idea i have no idea yeah um again you know it's like that, that question arjuna asked krishna what are the external criteria he, he didn't give any really yeah he gave right. in, internal criteria which may, right. not, may not which may not at all be evident from the outside right and which is why um which is why i can't look at someone and go you are, you aren't, because mm -hmm. I'm not having their internal experience. Right. And and I can look at people like Robert or Jed McKenna or Adi Ashanti or Jeff Foss or whatever and say, well, what they're talking about seems to line up for me. And, mm -hmm. you know, I like what they're saying. Or this doesn't work or whatever, you know. Right. Yeah, whether it resonates or not. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, somebody could get really good at the terminology uh, and, you know, they, they and talk a convincing talk, but I don't know. It, it seems to me that those who are really good at the terminology and aren't really grounded in it, they, they give themselves away at a certain point by kind of being fundamentalist or something about. And you know, if you if you listen to them enough, there's something that rubs you the wrong way. <laughs> at least for me. Um, you know, earlier in the interview, you said something about things are still falling away or. To get the words you use, they're still, you know, deepening or refining. Or, or can you remind me of how you said that and, and elaborate a bit? Um, what it feels like is um, because 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 there's a, a realization that there's nothing but the one, or the, not because. Let me say, I don't know if I can actually talk about it. Okay. It, it may just be terminology. I may just be saying that because I don't know how else to express what's absolutely just happening. You know, um, so it appears still sometimes like there are places where I am stuck. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't actually think that. And then it just appears like that experience is, is happening. So, for instance, let's say... Um, I run into difficulty or I feel very attached to some situation that I'm going through and I feel in it, like stuck in it and not having any perspective, um, any objective perspective. Uh, what, what if I, you know, I notice my mind wants to go, oh, here's a place where 
you the ego hasn't completely disappeared yet mm-hmm. and is that true i don't know that's just what it feels like and that still doesn't negate the 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 sense that i talked about before of this is all still what it is experiencing itself in this moment as someone completely involved in this situation you know completely engrossed unable to get out of it unable to find any objectivity and so i think that's part of that uh, what I would call like maybe a deepening process, just an awareness like this is still all going to happen the way it's meant to turn out and or the way it's turning out and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. And I don't, uh, does that answer your question? Uh, partially, maybe I'll pursue it a little bit more. Um, the reason that whole topic fascinates me is that, you know, in talking to some of the people we just mentioned, like Adi Shanti and Ganaji and different people, um, they all almost universally say there's still a never-ending refinement taking place. Yeah. And, and Gangaji, for instance, quoted Nisargadatta as having said towards the end of his life that since he had written I Am That, you know, years earlier, there had been, he said that was like kid stuff, there's been huge, uh, I don't know if he used the word progress or not, but huge sort of still deepening or refinement, whatever adjectives we want to use. And it kind of fascinates me to, you know, I mean, Adyashanti, when he had his first major awakening, his voice literally said to him, this is this is not the end. Keep going, and um, so I'm intrigued with the uh, post awakening uh, roadmap and what people in, uh, encounter as they continue to deepen or mature in that realization. Words again being very limited to refer to it, but it, I, I wonder if there's really any end to it, and um, you know what the higher reaches of possibility might be. Yeah, I don't, I I totally understand that. And I don't know, you know, what they talk about the gateless gate in, in uh, some of the, I'm not, yeah, see, I'm so totally unfamiliar with the literature. I am, I am totally not familiar with the literature. So I use these words and it's like, does she even know where they came from? I don't even know, you know. I think that's um, a Zen thing, but who knows? Anyway, uh, that's, that is somewhat like what it felt like, like, okay, uh, there's a gate and you walk through it and then you look back and there's no gate. It was all just, you know, it's all just incredibly this, now it's the, 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 the image inside of me is like this void, Mm -hmm. a mate, like a, a void. And, and, and so in that sense, there's a deepening or there's an exploration of the void. What is you know, what is exploring the void and, and be, to be in this and, and deepen into it and like get comfortable with it and, and then be able to talk about it and, and express it. And, you know, I notice it with Robert, he's been, he's been 20 or more years, maybe longer since experience. And, as you say, in his book, he is so clear about things that are so hard to talk about. Mm-hmm. He, he's got this real gift of expressing, and I think that's partly a function of his being a writer for his whole life, mm-hmm. but also a function of his being in it for so long. Yeah. For, me, for me, since it's been less than a, it's been like a year, basically. Mm-hmm. It's like, the, you know, I'm at the beginning of the carnival, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I have no, you know, I have, I don't express nearly as clearly and that I'm not sitting in it that long, you know. I would suggest perhaps, uh, this is just, a, you know, somewhat theoretical, somewhat based on experience, uh, both my, my own and other people's, um, that, you know, whatever faculties we may have, speech, perception, emotions, um, intellect, all those different things could perhaps continue to be infused with uh, and integrated with greater greater degrees of, of that oneness and, and thereby enhanced in their functioning. So in, in your case, you're speaking, you're alluding to bil- ability to express this. Of course, you know, you focus your attention on anything, you'll get better at expressing it. But, you know, to really speak about this in a, uh, a clear and useful way, there has to be uh, a... a a saturation of experience in it, not just a matter of learning the right words. Um, and so, I don't know, it almost seems to me that, it, that you know, once the, 
that realization has taken place, then it almost like turns around and begins to saturate more and more into every structure of one's um, relative makeup. That's a really good way to say it, and that feels a lot like what I've been experiencing. You know, so I appreciate you being able to say it that way because that it feels like that a saturation of that into all of those relative experiences. Mm. Um, and yet, there's no mistake that that it's done. Right. In other words, it's absolutely done. I was talking about this with Robert the other night. It's like I said, I know I. There's just a certainty that exists, mm -hmm. an absolute that rock, that point, that anchor. And then what happens after that is just this, like what you said, saturation of that one big bang, you know, like spreading throughout the whole organism and all the, the, the systems that it's involved with. And it, partly why, you know, it's interesting because when I talked to you about you interviewing me, um, at the time I was like, oh, I, I, really, I just have, to, I want to tell everybody and I share it because we don't hear this perspective too often of, of the sort of newly awakened. Okay, I, that just sounds so terrible, but anyway, <laughs> you know, like where it's so fresh, you know, like it, in time it's just happened. And uh, as the experience has been deepening or as that's been going on, I have got less desire to, to speak about it. So mm. even since we talked about the interview and stuff, so it's kind of uh, ironic that we're being, you know, that we're doing the interview. <laughs> And, I should, should have caught you six months yeah, ago. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. You know, I said I, I had talked to Robert about. You know, I said maybe I won't, and he said, "Well, you know, you'll see what happens." So, yeah. How do I know I should? Because <laughs> here I am. So. Yeah. Well, you yeah. Can cancel it. Yeah. Good. Well, I'm glad we did. Um, I think this is. I didn't know what to anticipate, um, and I, you know, I, I knew less about you than I know about most of the people I interview because most of them have a lot of YouTube videos out there and stuff, and I'll listen to six, eight hours during the week before I interview them while yeah. I'm, while I'm, you know, brushing my teeth and riding my bike and stuff like that. And, uh, but there wasn't that much out there on you. So I thought, well, I'm just going to wing this and, and see where, where it goes. But it's, I think it's gone very well. So I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation and it's yeah. not necessarily over, but I'm kind of running out of No, no, <laughs> no, no, I get it. I get it. No. And there isn't a lot. And you know, I, there's been part of me that said, put more out and I have nothing more to say. So I'm just really, uh, you know, it, it, when something occurs to me, I do. And, yeah. you know, and the, there's just, it's just not needed. I mean, there's so much out there. There's so many pointers and some, so many of them are much better than what I can say. Mm. And uh, it's not for anybody else anyway, really. The experience is for this one, you know. Yeah. That's kind of the way I feel, which is why I'm in the business of asking questions. I wouldn't dream of getting up on a on a, a podium and talking like Adyashanti or something like that. I just don't have the, that sort of talent, uh, nor the, probably the, the, certainly the depth of, and clarity of experience. So, you know, we're all just playing our roles, hold, holding up our sticks. <laughs> There's yeah, this, absolutely. There, that holding up our sticks um, point is a reference to a story in the Puranas or something where there was this village that was dear to Lord Krishna and Indra got jealous of uh, the fact that all the people loved Lord Krishna so much. And so he made this huge downpour occur and it was raining and the village was just getting inundated with water and the, the, the people cried out to Krishna to help them. And he came along and he picked up this mountain and held it up over the village as an umbrella from the rain. And the, but then the people began to think, oh, but, it, you know, it's a, it's a very heavy mountain. We better help him. So they all picked up little sticks and they held up their sticks to sort of support <laughs> the mountain. <laughs> of course, it didn't contribute at all to because <laughs> he was able to take care of it. So so we're all holding up our sticks, you know, doing our little things. But there's really a much more va uh, infinitely vast kind of a <laughs> puppeteer running the show. Well, that's such a good analogy. I often, you know, that's often an experience I have of, gosh, I'm such a puppet. I mean... And we all are, you know, and and that implies in a sense, um, I don't mean to imply it like it's, uh, you know, something not good. It's just ego. No, I don't want to say ego because that's, of course, a construct as well. You know, we want to take credit for everything that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just for me now, it's just so fun to see where I want to do that and just go 
you know, that's just Natalie, come on. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's just yeah. not it, you know? And, and, and I am a puppet. I mean, and the, the you know, it's, and it, what's wrong with that? You know, mm-hmm. to me, that's, I'm saved. Katie uses that word a lot. I'm saved. You know, I'm, I don't have to worry about what's happening next. It's coming and I, you know, I don't have a choice. I'm going to do whatever I do. And, and, uh, it's so fun to, to watch it, you know, Mm -hmm. so fun to watch it and scary too, because who knows what I'll do? What if I hit somebody in my car? What if I, you know, all that stuff is still, uh, all possibilities exist, you know? Well, you know, there's that saying, give credit where credit is due. And uh, if, we're, if we're assuming the authorship of action, then we're a thief, in a sense. We're, we're appropriating to ourselves that to, which doesn't belong to us all in actuality. Yeah, yeah. Nothing belongs, you know. And so it's like, and, and, and then, you know, people get upset about that because uh, a lot of, uh, because there's a lot of riding on blame and, you know, he did that and she did that and you know and even whole religions are founded on you know who did what to whom and you know <laughs> War and, and exactly exactly so it, you know the sweet part about it for me is I see what people do and I see what I do and isn't that interesting and and it's all I don't, and I'm not trying to be goody two shoes or flip. It it really, you know, because those emotional responses, and like you said, we we then charge in to fix it or take action, are also part of the whole picture. Mm-hmm. Um, but to see the show, the Leela, you know, the play, it's like, and be part of that, and I'm the role. Here's my role in it, and what is it going to look like today? Is really fascinating. Mm. In the world, but not of it. I guess so, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, for sure, because in the world and totally realizing that, it, yeah, yeah, you said it. <laughs> Actually, Jesus, Jesus said it. I just oh, yeah. him. <laughs> you said it right now, right. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, this is great. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, we could, could probably go on all day, but yeah, probably shouldn't. Um, <laughs> Uh, so let's, let's wrap it up a little bit. So, um, I've been talking with Natalie Gray, um, very much enjoying this conversation and Natalie is a student, I guess you could say, or, uh, of Robert Wolf with whom I'll be speaking next week. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Say hi to Robert for me, by the way. I will. And I would like to clarify, um, uh-huh. I'm not necessarily a student of Robert's. He's a friend of mine. He's a friend of mine. And he he was somehow instrumental in your awakening, whatever. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. there you go. I don't study him, let's put it that way. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, His his candle helped to light your candle. Yeah, his and a lot of others. So I want to be clear because I know, uh, you know, a lot of, for a lot of people, there's, this was my guru and this was my guru. And I adore Robert and the whole world has been my guru. I mean, I'm not going to... You know, I'm the whole world, literally every encounter. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Good. Well, so he was one of your teachers. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, this, uh, let me just uh, make a couple concluding points, which is that, um, you know, however you may be watching this, there's one place where you can go to see them all. Uh, I do a new one each, each week. Uh, and that is batgap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the gas pump. You'll also see there links to being able to subscribe to a podcast if you'd like to listen to this on your iPod or MP3 player. And uh, there's a discussion group that springs up around each interview. People get into chatting about what was discussed. Um, you can sign up for an email newsletter there to be notified each time a new interview is posted. And there's a donation button if you feel like clicking that. Um, so that's about it. So thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you, Rick. And thank you to everyone who is listening or watching. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.